Hello, Internet. Welcome back to Weeb Revolution. I'm Andre. Tonight, I'm here to try to sell you all on an under-discussed gem. A brilliant piece of media. An excellent show with a couple of problems, but plenty of strong pathos, action, and intrigue. My ninth favorite anime ever. A late 2000s show called Darker Than Black. Because this video is a recommendation, it's my job to clear up some confusion regarding the watch order. God forbid you actually watch it out of order, and then come back here to shout at me when you don't understand what's happening in the plot. There's a 26 episode first season, which is called Darker Than Black, Kuro no Keyaksha. There's the 4 episode OVA series, Darker Than Black Gaiden, which works best if watched immediately after season 1. And then there's a 12 episode second season, Darker Than Black, Gemini of the Meteor. This sounds like a mostly intuitive watch order. But the complicated thing comes when you look at the order the seasons aired. The OVA series meant to bridge the gap between seasons came out after season 2. I mean, I'm glad they made the OVA, it's probably the most compelling stretch of the entire franchise. So much so that it made me and my boyfriend sob when we watched it. Can confirm, I cried like a baby. But I don't blame fans at the time when the anime was still new, who originally watched season 1, went to season 2, and then were super confused about everything that was happening. Anyway, rant aside. Darker Than Black is the brainchild of Tensai Okumaru, a former Cowboy Bebop storyboarder and creator of the anime Wolf's Reign. In a 2007 interview, Okumaru once described what inspired him to first make the show. When I was young, I read a lot of manga, stories of ninjas, spies, or superheroes. The one that struck me the most is a manga by Shirato Sanpei about ninjas. There were a lot of techniques in the story to allow children to learn ninja art, and this aspect influenced me a lot. Added to this was the spirit and atmosphere of the spy series that rocked my childhood, like The Fugitive. I wanted to mix these influences. Darker Than Black is rather interesting because it isn't adapted from a manga, but has instead an anime original story. Two manga spin-off adaptations were later produced, and even written and illustrated by the anime's character designer, Yuji Iwahara, but I haven't read them, so I really can't say anything about them. Setting-wise, Darker Than Black, at least season 1 anyway, is primarily set in modern Tokyo. It revolves around various intelligence agencies and paramilitary groups utilizing contractors for assassinations and espionage. These contractors are distinguished from your typical metahuman in that they must perform a specific habit each time they use their power. Sometimes it's drastic like breaking a finger or forcing yourself to vomit, other times it's as benign as drinking hot milk or flipping over a pair of shoes. There's also another class of altered human beings called dolls. I won't talk too much about them here, but know that all dolls have the power to spy on people through certain conduits like water or glass. Our primary four characters include Hei, a contractor with electricity powers, a blind doll named Yin, a black cat named Sherman Miao, I mean Mao, with his codename anyway, and an ex-Japanese cop named Huang. Other important characters include a special unit of the Tokyo police along with their chief Misaki. Misaki herself gets a lot of screen time and serves as our point of view for the government slash legal side of things. There are also a number of foreign agents, reoccurring civilian characters, an incompetent yet endearing detective duo. Broadcast doesn't have my favorite show. What is that, anime? And why are you watching that nerdy crap while I'm paying you to work for me anyhow? And rogue factions of contractors. Something really unique about Darker Than Black Season 1 is that each story arc consists of two episodes. It follows something of a Monster of the Week formula with Hay and his team on different missions for the Syndicate, while also facing up against whatever new colorful contractor is trying to kill them. The cool thing is that Darker Than Black does not maintain a hard status quo. The events from each arc are not forgotten, but instead carry over, even if not always immediately noticeable. Important characters introduced in one arc tend to make a return later, pivotal character development is not forgotten, and by the end of the first season, most of the main cast have changed and become very different people. Additionally, there is a lot of variation even just within Season 1's formula. You always get something different each arc. The OVA series and Season 2 do both move away from this style of storytelling in favor of a much more standard serialized format, but I felt it was important to let you all know what you're getting into when you start Season 1. Darker Than Black is, for lack of a better term, a dark show. People are battered, slashed, ignited, and frequently electrocuted. Bodies are sometimes just thrown about, blood is in excess, but at the end of the day that's what makes this anime such a thrilling watch. 
Any fight can become a fatal encounter and you can't help but get glued to the screen. The good thing about Darker Than Black, however, is that it also gives the audience variety. Certain arcs are definitely more dark and violent, but others can be lighthearted and, honestly, very comedic. This show can be fucking hilarious when it wants to be. If I was crazy, I'd toss you down there and watch you sink. Now hold on, that's animal abuse. What are you, some kind of sociopath? Who's there? Music is important in setting tone too, and Cowboy Bebop's legendary composer Yoko Kano worked on the OST for Dark and Black. She gave the show a lot of high-energy jazzy songs, but also slower, melancholic songs. And the slow songs are there because Darker Than Black gets moody and also gets really emotional. Nothing hits harder for me than Season 2's melancholic opening song. or the OVA's devastatingly powerful Astro song, Can You Fly? And for me, that's what I look for in a good anime. Does it make me cry? Does it make me care about the characters? Speaking of the characters... In the same 2007 interview I cited earlier, Okumaru elaborated on how he went about crafting the characters of Darker Than Black. The main characters of Wolf's Reign are certainly wolves, but if you look closely, they are very pure and uh, they are real heroes. In Darker Than Black, I wanted to return to characters that were not only human, but also had a more developed dark side. I wanted them to have flaws, bad sides. This ideal is very present in the show's protagonist, Hei. He's a perfect balance of edgy badassery and cruelty, but also kindness and emotional vulnerability. His characterization is subtle, and there are always several layers to his personality at work, depending on which persona he's putting on in any given scene. I'll refrain from talking too much about him, since the show reveals his backstory gradually, but know that he's a great protagonist. It also helps that he's super cute. Yin is absolutely one of my favorite characters from this anime. Think of her along the lines of Lane from Serial Experiments Lane, or Ray from Evangelion. You know, that character archetype where there's a specific blend of soft-spokenness, tragedy, and endearment, all rolled into a supernatural, neurodivergent package. I really enjoy the juxtaposition between her clairvoyance and her blindness. You get the sense that she's simultaneously very aware, yet very unaware. Like I said, very neurodivergent. Can relate. Mao and Huang are great supporting characters as well. Huang is usually in charge of relaying the objectives of the missions or sending important messages from the Syndicate to Hei. He also sometimes takes an active role in plotting out the more elaborate heists. All of this is usually done with a cigarette in his mouth and some kind of snide remark ready like he's a 1950s detective. You can definitely see the anime's noir influences whenever this man is on screen. All you have to do is keep your head down and follow your orders. Just like always. Mao never gets the same level of death as the other three on his team, which is a bit of a shame considering that he's present throughout almost all of the franchise, but he's always fun to watch. He's the eyes of the team, scouting out certain locations inconspicuously, which is always super funny since he's literally a talking cat. What are you, some kind of sociopath? There's a plethora of different villains too, but I'll let you all discover them as you watch. Just note that not every villain is cut from the same cloth. Some of them are just paid killers and assassins without that much complexity behind them, but others offer genuinely compelling motivations and backstories, even to the degree where you wish they could have at least gotten to have some kind of happy ending. I love this anime for a lot of reasons. The quality of the visuals is definitely one of them. This was Studio Bones in the mid to late 2000s, so this was them at their goddamn peak. The ninja, spy, and superhero elements that Okumaro was obsessed with as a kid blend together in Darker Than Black to make some of my favorite fights in anime ever. The choreography is fast and exciting. The animation becomes very fluid and very smooth during some scenes. And with solid directing behind it, the fights are always well placed and well utilized. The art style is really nice and easy on the eyes too. Yuji Iwahara made the original designs, while Takahiro Komori adjusted them a bit to be more animation friendly. There's just something about this show's aesthetic that really works for me. Maybe I'm just nostalgic for the cell-animated and digital color aesthetics of 2000 anime. 
Maybe it also brings up memories of Batman Beyond during particularly kinetic fights that feel extra superhero-y. But for whatever reason, I really adore how almost everything in this show looks. And don't worry about the quality of the fights dropping between seasons. They stay consistently great. This is a difficult thing to praise in a mostly spoiler-free recommendation of the show. Just know that Dark Than Black creates an interesting world full of intrigue, suspense, and mystery that'll leave you wanting to watch more and more. Season 1 is insular given that it focuses almost exclusively on Tokyo, which makes sense to be fair given that Hell's Gate is a crucial plot point, but Gaiden and Season 2 are set in various places around the world from Hong Kong to parts of Europe and even a decent amount of time in Russia. This also means that Darker Than Black has a decently diverse cast of characters. The protagonist, Hei, is Chinese, there are a couple of European characters like Yin who's Swedish, and there are even a handful of black characters. And the show isn't just rich in ethnic diversity, season 2 has a few minor queer characters and I found them to be mostly respectable portrayals for a late 2000s anime. Story-wise, you'll find that Darker Than Black explores questions about what it means to be a contractor, how contractors behave and emote differently from regular humans, and if contractors could even coexist in the same world as humans. There are some really interesting things to be analyzed from the show, but again, this is a mostly spoiler-free recommendation. In a 2017 interview with Anime News Network, Okumaru was asked this. There's a big shift between seasons of Darker Than Black. I find that people have reacted very strongly, either positive or negative, to the shift. I wanted to ask what the thinking was behind the big tone and story changes between Darker Than Black 1 and 2. One thing that came up was, why make something the same? Why make something similar in the continuation? Let's do something different. In the first season, there were quite a few things that could be difficult to understand, so kind of a change of tone would be good. Maybe the protagonist in the first one was a bit too much of a rough working guy. Uh, so why don't we put something like a little cute girl at the center of season 2? Just something different. When the anime creator himself concedes that the story is confusing, you know it's a problem. I've also seen that others online share a similar sentiment. Even the people who really like the show will say that it's confusing. And that makes me sad to talk about this part because Darker Than Black has a good story. I even said that earlier. However, I feel that it doesn't explain itself well enough. Now, I don't expect a sci-fi show to always make sense, but some stuff in the OVA in Season 2 and even Season 1 are just genuinely confusing or not fleshed out enough. If we had gotten a better kind of explanation regarding a few MacGuffins or plot points, that wouldn't be such a huge problem, but the sloppy explanations are there, and they're undeniable. It's not even a problem of the show having unresolved mysteries. It's fine if we don't understand everything about Hell's Gate or the Contractor's origins, but being easier to understand would have helped. This is also why I put emphasis on you experiencing the anime's story chronologically. If you watch it in the order everything was aired, then all of the confusion will end up compounding and making the viewing experience less enjoyable. Hey goes from twink to drunk, disheveled dilf later, and it's really not a good look for him. Now, I tend to prefer subs, but if a dub is particularly good, then I always make sure to try it out. And god dang, this might be my favorite Funimation dub ever. Jason Libershit does badass and cool really well, but his shy and friendly scenes are always a joy to watch. Kent Williams does a fantastic job as Mao. I will never complain about hearing exposition when it comes from this guy. Bathing, eating at a table, it's all very pleasant, but not exactly exciting. At least no one ever complains when they see me sleeping away the afternoons in the park. Brina Palencia does a great job as Yin. There's this really soothing quality to her voice, and she brings the best performance when it comes to those emotional scenes. A lot of the supporting cast is pretty solid too. You'll definitely recognize a decent number of voice actors if you watched anime dub before. Chuck Huber is here. Christopher Sabat is here, Laura Bailey too, etc. If you want a good action anime with excellent suspense, intrigue, and pathos, then please watch Darker Than Black. It's such a great show, but it always makes me sad that I don't see many people talking about it nowadays. It's a shame too, because those who have seen it tend to think very well of it. It deserves to be regarded as a 2000s era classic. Anyway, thanks for watching. Sorry there wasn't much left this content in this video except for that one Chairman Meow joke. Like and subscribe, hit that bell, leave a comment that I'll be too socially anxious to read, and have a lovely day!